Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to our quarterly town hall. And today's topic is our 2024 operating budget. And we are going to uh, begin, as usual, with Barnabas. And we are hoping that he brings laughter to this meeting. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That was a joke. That was my first one. OK, caught that one. All right, so before I get into prayer, everyone knows that I'm an all-star comedian, correct? We know that every meeting I come up with a very good joke, and you guys love it, correct? Those watching on Channel 95, I hear you laughing, but correct? Thank you. All right, so I wrote the joke down this time. I'm going to tell you why, okay? I wrote the joke down. So today we had a meeting, correct, and I direct the meeting, and Ms. Susan says, Hey, Barnabas, I hope you have a joke for today. I said, Miss Susan, I have a lot of work to do. She was like, oh, no, not that joke. Do you have a second one? <laughs> so I decided, oh, that wasn't a joke. That was, a, that was the truth, but okay. That was a joke. Clap for that one. <laughs> okay, that, yeah, so I decided to write it down. Since so she made that joke, I decided I'd make one that's better. Okay, everybody agree? So Father Murphy was playing golf with a parishioner. And it's a chaplain joke. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. On the first hole... He sliced through the rough, and his opponent heard him mummer and say, Hoover, under his breath. The second time he goes and he hit the ball, he hits it into the lake. And he says, Hoover. And the opponent's like, man, why is he continuing to say Hoover? Then the third time he goes, he gets a new ball, he puts it, and it hits right next to the hole. He says, Jesus. Then he goes again, he puts it, and the ball goes around, and he says, what? Hoover. And the opponent goes to him and says, why do you say Hoover? He says, because it's the biggest dam in the world. <laughs> oh, man, I'm doing better. I'm doing better, right? Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have another one, but I'll save it to the end just in case you want more. So let us pray. Oh, heavenly gracious Father, thank you for this meeting today. Thank you for the gift of laughter, for there's so much to be sad about in this world, Father, and just moments like this when we can laugh is great. So, Father, continue to give us peace. Continue to be the center of this meeting. Father, as we discuss the business of Acts, Father, please, Lord, let us do it with joy and love, and let us continue to exhibit love and kindness, not only um, in Acts, but in our personal lives. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for today and the present, for the present is a gift that only you can give. And today we get a chance to experience it. And because of that, we say thank you. So God, be with us in every way. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, that was, pre that was pretty good, I have to admit. That was Hoover good. <laughs> All right, so before we um, show the film, I want to introduce um, our special guests who are gonna, going to be presenting and answering questions at the end. First, we have Sue Ahern. She's our Senior Vice President, Chief Operate, Financial Officer, um, CFO. We're really pleased you're here with us today, Sue. And we also have George Bryan, our Vice President of Operations for the Southeast Regional um, Area um, Division. So welcome both George and Sue. At this time, I'm going to play the video that's been also airing on Channel 95, and then afterwards, George will come up and um, we'll open it up to a discussion opportunity. Hello, I'm Karen Christensen, president of Axe Retirement Life Communities. Recently, you received a letter from me announcing a monthly fee increase for 2024 that was approved by the Board of Directors. The monthly fee increase is determined each year as a result of our comprehensive budget process. In addition to providing details about the budget and the reasons for the increase in the letter, it is our tradition to hold a town hall meeting each year to provide you additional information and have an opportunity to ask questions. We are pleased to provide this pre-recorded presentation, which provides you the opportunity to watch at a time convenient for you. A question and answer session will then be scheduled at your community. 
The date and time of that meeting will be provided by your executive director. As I stated, the purpose of this presentation is to review the 2024 operating budget. We will focus on the budget for the Act's obligated group because it's the changes in the revenue and expenses of the obligated group that determine the monthly fee increase for the communities that are part of the obligated group and within the legal entity of Act's Retirement Life Communities. In addition to Act's Retirement Life Communities, Act Signature Community Services, which includes home health, hospice, and physician services, is a member of the obligated group, as are the management companies that provide management services across the organization. There continues to be affiliates of Acts outside of the obligated group, including Acts Legacy Foundation, Acts Acquisition and Development Company, Acts Retirement Life Communities of Maryland, and our newest affiliates, Meese Life and Meese Life Residence Foundation. The affiliates have their own budgets and related monthly fee increases. Willow Valley Communities is a sister organization to Axe Retirement Life Communities and joined our organization through a strategic alliance. Willow Valley Communities remains a separate legal entity with its own board, management team, and brand. During the budget process, we met with resident leadership and we explained the budget process as it relates to the calendar, stating that it begins in spring and ends in the fall, with the majority of work occurring over the summer months. We spend this much time on the budget because of its importance. The budget planning process is linked to the strategic plan and supports the outcomes that are included in it which include financial objectives that serve to maintain the financial health of the organization and support the investment grade bond rating. During the budget process, we review every revenue and expense line item across every department in every community, which helps ensure alignment of certain operating procedures and financial objectives. Finally, as we combine all the budget objectives, at the end of the process, management makes a recommendation for the board's consideration of an annual monthly fee increase. Sue Ahern, Axis Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Peggy Valdivia, Vice President and Controller, will review the primary influences and assumptions and other main drivers of the monthly fee increase, as well as how the budget was balanced to achieve all of our objectives, including the lowest possible fee increase while maintaining our financial health. It is my pleasure to introduce Sue Ahern. Thank you, Karen. Hello, I'm Sue Ahern, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Axe. As part of the budget process, it's important to look at the world around us to see how external influences impact the budget. The economic situation remains unsettled as we progress through the fourth quarter of 2023. Inflation for September was 3.7% much lower than the 9.1% peak in June of 2022. The Fed started taking action in March of 2022 and increased rates 11 times to curb inflation, which as you can see has been successful, but not down to the desired target of 2%, as noted on the orange line on the graph on the right side of the screen. The percent change in all items, food, and all items less food and energy are still running higher than the target. This means there could be an additional interest rate hike before year end. The Fed interest rate hikes have also impacted the real estate market by causing an increase in mortgage rates. The high mortgage rates are contributing to a lack of supply as it's keeping homeowners from listing their homes for sale because they want to keep their current lower mortgage rates. An imbalance remains between supply of homes for sale and demand as the demand from buyers currently exceeds supply. Typically, a six-month supply of homes means a balanced market. In September, the month's supply was 3.4, and 2024 is expected to continue to be a seller's market. 
Existing home sale median prices, noted in the box on the top, remain lower and more affordable than new homes in this higher mortgage rate environment. This benefits our prospective residents who have a home to sell as buyers are driven to the more affordable existing homes versus new homes. The strength of the labor market could be the driver of another rate hike by the Fed, as it's not cooling like they had hoped to keep inflation in check. 336,000 jobs were added in September, compared to 170,000 predicted. 96,000 of those were in leisure and hospitality, and 41,000 in the healthcare sector. Both of these sectors heavily impact the Act's organization and continue to put pressure on our wages. Compounding the labor issue is the decline in labor force participation. There was a bump in participation during the last quarter of 2019, followed by the significant drop in 2020 due to the pandemic. While it has rebounded slightly, there are over 1.5 million less people working or actively seeking work now than in 2019. Some of the decline is due to the aging workforce, and you can see in the box on the left side, the forecast for the next several years is a continued decline in labor force participation as the boomers complete their careers. This makes technology and workforce efficiency that much more important. Because the imbalance exists between jobs available and workers actively seeking employment, it continues to put pressure on wages. The graph on the top left shows that there are 1.5 job openings per unemployed worker. The unemployment rate, which was 3.8% in September, continues to remain near 50-year lows and contributes to wage pressure as well. Many job openings exist with not a large pool of workers to fill them. As companies compete for workers, pressure will remain on wages for the foreseeable future unless there is a recession. Due to the high inflation during 2021 and 2022, a gap remains between wage growth over the past few years and inflation. This means overall, workers have lost purchasing power over the past few years, even with higher pay rate increases. It's forecasted to align by the fourth quarter of 2024. The big question is whether or not there will be a recession during the later part of 2023 or 2024. The yield curve has been inverted since July of 2022, meaning short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates. Every recession has been preceded by an inverted yield curve, but not all inverted yield curves point to a recession. The labor market remains strong, as evidenced by all of the jobs being added, and the real estate market remains resilient despite the high mortgage rates. This could be causing a delay with a recession. Experiencing a recession in 2024, while still unknown, is looking less likely. The chance of a soft landing has improved based on the action taken by the Fed to date. Although a threat remains with the resumption of student loan payments, possibility of a government shutdown, and union strike activity, which can all negatively impact GDP, which is gross domestic product, and consumer spending, weakening the economy. As we look ahead to 2024, we know economic conditions remain uncertain. The current job market remains strong based on the number of jobs added and continued low unemployment. The Fed could raise rates again to try and reduce inflation closer to the 2% target. The housing market is expected to remain stable, even with high mortgage rates, due to the imbalance between the supply of homes for sale and the demand. This means a possible recession will not be real estate related. Economists are predicting unemployment to increase but remain low during 2024. Competition for workers across many industries will continue to put pressure on wages unless there is a recession, 
which is looking less likely, although the threat still remains. While much is uncertain, we do know that the Social Security Cost of Living Adjustment, or COLA, will be 3.2% as was previously announced. The monthly fee increase is not tied to the COLA. The COLA increase looks back historically and only at a three-month period. The monthly fee increase looks to the future and how will our revenues and expenses change, specifically the salary and wage increase. During my 24-year tenure with the organization, the COLA has only exceeded the monthly fee increase five times. Two of those times happen to be this year and last year. Overall, we are anticipating improvement in our financial objectives over the 2023 budget results, while taking into account what's happening in the labor market and the economy. Now it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Peggy to walk you through our occupancy, revenue, and expense assumptions. Thank you, Sue. I'm Peggy Valdivia, Vice President and Controller for Axe. It is truly an honor to present the 2024 operating budget. Starting off with our first assumption, independent living occupancy, as that has the greatest impact on our revenues. When we look at independent living occupancy, we'd like to see occupancy roll from one budget year to the next. Based on the strong sales activity year to date through September, we are anticipating that the 5,545 units occupied at the end of the year, which matches our 2023 budget, will be the beginning of the year occupancy for 2024. Consistent with our history, the majority of our move-ins are expected to happen during the fourth quarter. Occupancy will improve during 2024 since move-ins outpace turnover by 89 ending the year with 5,634 occupied residences. The 742 move-ins are made up of 88 initial sales related to the expansion of Matthews Glen in North Carolina. The number of resales and preview to life care move-ins during 2024 is anticipated to increase slightly over the 2023 budget, while the number of units turning over is estimated to increase by one. As such, the 89 net move-ins are primarily related to the independent living expansion units generating initial sales. In the healthcare center, the 2024 budget assumes an aggregate occupancy of 77% for Oak Bridge Terrace and 84% for Willowbrook Court. This means that some communities may be above these percentages while others will be below. As part of the budget process, we will review the payer mix in Willowbrook Court with each community. You can see in the bottom of the box that the payer mix remains relatively consistent year to year with life care residents having the highest utilization. For the private pay residents in Oak Bridge Terrace and Willowbrook Court, we increase the room and board rates each year. Based on a competitive analysis, the average rate increase is 3.5% for Oak Bridge Terrace and 7.4% for Willowbrook Court. CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, did announce a 6.3% increase for the Medicare reimbursement rates, which will be offset by a 2.3% for the second phase of the PDPM, or Patient Driven Payment Model, parity adjustment. This is an improvement over the prior year where no increase was passed on. The affiliate communities pay the obligated group a management fee of 4% of their revenue and entrance fees. The 2024 budget includes management fee income of approximately 6.9 million from the affiliated communities. The first expense assumption is related to full-time equivalents or FTEs with a decrease of eight compared to the 2023 budget. We calculate full-time equivalents by taking the total budgeted team member hours and dividing by 2,080. This means that you could have two or more team members making up one full-time equivalent if they work part-time. 
The change in FTEs are categorized in three different areas seen to the right. An increase of 33 related to the development and expansion of independent living units in Oak Bridge Terrace at Matthews Glen, and the addition of 12 Meese Life team members joining the management company, which is offset by management fees. The addition of seven FTEs for new and expanding programs relate to the expansion of personal fitness and the implementation of a new audiology program. Finally, there is a decrease of 48 FTEs compared to the 2023 budget due to a decrease in census and home health billable hours based on resident utilization, offset by an increase in the per patient day staffing levels. This budget maintains our residents per FTE of 2.0, consistent with past years. The increase in the average wage rate between the 2023 budget and 2024 is due to the approved base salary and wage increase, as we will see in the upcoming slides. Each year, we evaluate a number of different compensation surveys, publications, and our own experience in hiring and retaining team members and evaluating what increase to pass on to our workforce. Due to national conditions of persistent low unemployment, high job openings, along with the gap in wages compared to national inflation, and recent labor events and trends, the board approved a tiered salary increase providing a 4.5% increase to hourly team members, 3.75% to senior leadership, and 4% to all other salary team members, effective the third pay of the year, which is consistent with past practice. An additional 2.5 million is budgeted to cover market rate adjustments needed above and beyond the salary wage increase, as well as referral and sign-on bonus used for recruitment, an extra shift pay and manager discretionary bonuses, which are tools used to help reduce utilization of agency nursing. These dollars could also be used to cover excess agency nursing cost if needed. Team member benefits are a very important part of our compensation package that we provide to our team. The health insurance budget starts with actual claims experience and then adjust for market trends. Those market trends anticipate a 7.5% increase related to medical costs and a 9.8% increase for prescription drugs. We made minor medical plan changes to copays and deductibles. Team member contributions are planned to increase 3% to 7.5% depending upon the plan and coverage chosen. Supporting a cost share commensurate with prior years of 70% paid by the company and 30% paid by the team member. The vast majority of our team members elect single coverage, representing 71% of participation in the health insurance plans. In other expenses, the 2024 budget includes a 6% inflation factor in food costs. The increase in independent living census is offset by a decrease in healthcare center census and lower resident participation. We do anticipate a 2.5% increase in utility cost, largely related to increases in contract renewals for natural gas and an increase in communications based on current experience and recent technology investments. The 2024 budget assumes a 7.7% increase in insurance. The increase in insurance relates to property insurance rates based on recent renewals. The 2024 budget includes a 1% increase in contracted services due to continued increases in outsourced property management services commensurate with increased cost of labor offset by a decrease in agency nursing utilization. We anticipate a 5.7% increase in supply costs for system software, paper products, general parts, chemicals and cleaning supplies, and landscape-related supplies. All other expenses are increasing marginally at 0.3%. 
Now I'll walk through how the change in occupancy, revenues, and expenses impact the approved rate increases. To summarize the approved tiered salary and wage increase cost, $9.7 million. Team member benefits represent $3.2 million. The additional dollars to address compression, market rate adjustments, and other salary and wage dollars of $2.5 million. Contracted services, supplies, and food total $1.7 million of the increase, and fixed costs such as utilities, insurance, and real estate taxes account for $2.1 million of additional expense. These are offset by additional revenue generated by expansion revenues of $3.9 million and investment income of $1.8 million. If we net all of these numbers together, there's a total need of $13.5 million. And we know that a 1% increase in the monthly fee generates approximately $2.9 million in additional revenue. So based on management's recommendation, the board approved the following increases. A 4.65% increase to the monthly fee which will be applied to tier six, which is our current pricing. The dollar amount calculated on current pricing would then be applied to the lower tiers. This way, residents in the same size apartments will receive the same dollar value increase and share the increase in cost proportionally. As noted in the chart, 91% of our residents are on tier six. The same increase would be applied to the preview to life care rates. The board also approved up to a 4.65% increase for second persons with a cap of $2,100. Second persons currently exceeding the cap will not receive an increase. Finally, for new residents, entrance fees will increase 4.75% effective November 1st. Management at all levels of the organization works very hard every year to keep the monthly fee increase as low as possible while meeting the other budgeted objectives. Much thought and discussion took place this year regarding the increase for 2024 and the current economic situation. With the approved budget, our five-year average will be 4.68% and our 10-year average is 3.86%. Ziegler, an investment banking firm, conducts a CFO survey each year on what monthly fee increases providers are anticipating passing on to their residents. This year, the initial survey results were just above 5%. And at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Sue. Thank you, Peggy. One of our efforts during the budget process is to balance changes in revenue and expenses so that the outcome is the lowest possible monthly fee increase while meeting the financial objectives. Those financial objectives are set in support of our long-term financial viability. We measure a variety of financial indicators, one of which is operating income, which takes total revenue and subtracts total expenses. The 2024 budget is $1.9 million, showing slight improvement over the 2023 budget and notable improvement over 2022 actual. If we take the operating income and divide it by total revenue, it gives us the operating margin. The 2024 budget is basically at break even at 0.3% and is consistent with the 2023 budget and again performing better than 2022 actual results. Another way to measure financial performance is to look at cash activity only. The operating ratio compares cash expenses to cash revenue, so we want this number to be below 100%. The 2024 budget is 98.6%, again showing improvement over the 2023 budget and 2022 actual results. Since this is less than 100%, it means that cash revenue exceeds cash expenses, which provides for an operating surplus of $6.7 million. We take the estimated operating surplus, 
and add it to the net entrance fee proceeds of $170.4 million. We will use that cash to fund the following. First and foremost, we have to make our debt service payments, which include principal and interest, and are estimated at over $67 million. We will then fund the capital budget, which represents the improvements to the communities. In addition to the estimated $90 million, capital projects of close to $6 million will be funded through an anticipated 2023 project fund. This results in funded depreciation of 102%. We anticipate draws and payments of $7 million on the lines of credit. The remainder of approximately $13 million would be added to cash and reserves, a portion of which is required by state regulations. This cash flow activity is used to calculate two key financial indicators, which are also debt covenants, and are set at extremely low levels. The first is debt service coverage, which takes the $177 million of net cash proceeds and compares it to the $67 million of debt service. We anticipate a very healthy coverage level of 3.3 times. Days cash on hand measures liquidity as you take total cash and reserves, including those held as state required funds, and divide it into daily cash expenses, including interest. We are expecting days cash on hand to be 260 when we exclude the current unrealized losses on our investments. The financial performance supports our A- credit rating, which was affirmed by Fitch Ratings in June of 2023. We are part of a very elite group only 33 senior living providers have a rating in the A category. This provides additional comfort to residents that the organization is financially sound. We are often asked if the affiliate organizations have a negative impact on ACTS. The opposite is true. If we add the results of the affiliates to ACTS retirement life communities, we see improvements in the consolidated results. All affiliates are budgeted to achieve an operating surplus, which results in operating ratios either at or below 100%, which is favorable. When we add in the non-cash activity for the affiliates, the operating income and the operating margin improve in consolidation as well, bringing the operating income to 3.6 million and the operating margin to 0.5%. As we look forward to 2024, there still is uncertainty in the economy. Regardless of the challenges we face, providing quality services to our residents is and always will be our highest priority. Since we are a service industry, we need to offer competitive wages and benefits to attract and retain team members. And we know we will need to continue to address ongoing labor challenges and wage pressure. We'll continue to focus on occupancy while controlling expenses and recognizing operational efficiencies to protect the long-term financial health of the organization. At the same time, balancing all of these priorities so that the budget includes the lowest possible monthly fee increase. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation back over to Karen. Thank you, Sue and Peggy, and thank you for watching this presentation. I do hope you enjoyed it and have a better understanding of the key components and assumptions within the 2024 budget. If you have questions, please direct them to your executive director so they can be addressed during the community town hall meeting. We do thank you for your continued support, partnership and prayers as we continue to respond to various challenges and changing conditions. May God bless you, your loved ones, and the entire Axe family. Okay, this is for questions. We did not have any questions submitted in advance, but we'd be happy to entertain questions that might have come up from today's presentations. I see hands flying up everywhere. Yes. Um, I noticed the 67.1 million. Is that the uh, what is the balance on the bonds? No, that 
That represents our principal and our interest payments for 2024. Okay, what is the balance uh, that we still have on the bond issue? Um, for the obligated group, I think it's about 728 million today. Um, we make our principal payments in November, so usually about 18 million gets paid down, but we are in the process of doing another debt financing, hopefully before year end. You're gonna so do another debt, okay. It'll kind of balance and itself. What is the total reserves? Our cash and reserves are in the $300 million range. That's pretty good. And the Mies and the Willow, do they have the same increase that we do? Um, Willow Valley Communities and Mies Life, they do not. They're a little bit different. So for Willow Valley Communities, last year, they were higher than we were. They were at 7.9, we were at 7.5. This year, we're at, at 4.65, they're at 4.1. Now for Mies Life, they have a history of doing their increase a little bit differently, where it's one increase for current residents and, an, and a different increase for new residents, so it's kind of a blend between the two. Um, so that's what we did. We, we did a blend um, for existing residents and new residents. Thank you. That was pretty good, Sue. You were pretty close on those numbers. My question specifically concerns Edgewater, so I hope you're able to answer it. Six years ago, when uh, my late husband and I arrived here, one of our uh, questions and one of our concerns was the medical floor uh, in the respect that uh, it needed a lot of work. It was old, um, the facilities were not good, and we were told at the time it was in the works that it would be redone, the whole floor. I think they also had uh, uh, a roof problem too at the time. Uh, since then, about a year and a half after that, my husband unfortunately had to go into hospice on the medical floor. And I have to tell you, it was almost a disaster between the bed having to be replaced because it was so old and on and on, I won't go into specifics, but my concern is for the future. For myself personally, thank God I'm in good health right now. I'm not going to know whether this will be a year or two or three years from now. But I know that I would not like to be on that floor at this present time. So my question for you, what is in the works? Are you going to redo that floor? And if, when? So there's um, some answers in several segments, actually. And, and Sue, I might need your help with the, with the current strategy. But I can tell you what had happened, and, and, and Sue Ahern can help me with this one potentially, but we did have a master strategy to replace the building. Um, we had challenges we share with everyone with planning, the cost of construction increase, and then the pandemic. I believe the funding source for that was time sensitive, and, we, and so that funding was really became unavailable because we didn't have the, uh, the workforce and the time. I mean, the world stopped, essentially. So we did start with another process to address the roof, to address the conditions of the air conditioning systems and the infrastructure, and also have the building reevaluated because we were under the false assumption that the third floor had structural issues, hence why we would evacuate during hurricanes. We had it assessed, we had everything looked at, and they said, no, you're fine structurally. So we went ahead and fixed the roof, I believe, which is completed now in the process. January. So now we're in the process of the interior portion. So Susan, I don't know if you have more of a current update, but Susan's gonna share the current update, but we still haven't scrapped the idea to just reevaluate the space. Um, but there's a huge expense. Right now, the cost of construction has quadrupled from what it was 10 years ago. So it has to make sense financially for the organization, for the community, because essentially you're paying for it, we're paying for it. So we're trying to find balance, but we're, we're in agreement that it needed a lot of attention, and we started from the outside in, you know, because of structural and just making sure that we had the building integrity. Now Susan will talk about the strategy for the interior. 
So recently we um, hired an architectural firm. They're meeting with Melissa, the administrator, myself, Ross is included, as well as Peter, who is our regional manager for construction projects. And we are designing what the, the existing building should look like so that it's more home-like, it has um, bathrooms with showers, all the things that you would want if you lived in Willowbrook Court. So we're working on the design component. Once we get further along, we will share that with uh, the resident board and we will ask also for some input from perhaps family members or even spouses who might have someone living there to get their, their feedback and then we'll go from there. But we are currently working on that and the design work is being done right now. It's going to take a while because it, you know we have to plan it and design it, but it it is in the works. No time frame. No time frame but as we go further, once the design work is is further along and we get feedback from a select group of residents, then we'll be able to give you better time frames. Paula. We're talking all three floors, including Oak Bridge Terrace. There's a, before we take another question, there's another factor that's interesting, and, and this actually um, sped up because of, I believe, the um, pandemic. But utilization of the space has changed. So in some communities, Indian River Estates is an example, they closed an entire hall, 20 beds, when before the pandemic, they were busting at the seams. They're 120 bed, and they would get up to a census of 119, 120. So utilization has changed, but we have also changed our posture um, regarding the outside resources. So we would budget heavily for, for non-resident third parties, so like private pay and Medicare as a revenue source. So we changed the perspective to say, let's just, let's not look at that revenue source necessarily as a staple, let's focus on residents' needs. So focus on life care contract holders primarily, which then affords a different look. So then you look at the space you have and you say, well, we can make more private rooms and change the accommodations to meet the needs and the actuarials for the residents that are living at Edgewater, not also banking on outside revenue as part of the model. So through the pandemic, part of the evolution of our view of the future changes the utilization so that we can use our space more effectively. Uh, I've lived at Edgewater for 17 years, the last two of which have been in OBT. Now, I hope you realize that the increase of 4.6 or whatever it is for next year is already piggybacked on a huge increase of 6 point something the year before. So that makes our increase more than it would normally be because you you keep building like like uh, interest that is built on top of each other. Uh, so anyway, I also want to know why you did not include the millions of dollars you get from Medicare for rehab, which is in Willowbrook Court, and you get outside people are now allowed to come in from five-star or wh wh wherever they qualify. They have to meet the qualifications so that we get those millions of dollars in the first 21 days. Now, I get my EOBs for my uh, therapy as most residents of OBT are in therapy in another situation where it's millions of dollars you get from Medicare for our physical therapy. And yet, most of the residents that I speak with here are unaware that our rooms are not centrally air conditioned. I don't know how many people here are aware of that, but it's a true statement. We're so far behind St. Andrews, who, who was totally renovated uh, 10 years ago, but at the same time, we are such stepchildren. No central air, no hurricane windows. We're finally getting a roof. 
I was not going to move in to OBT until the windows were put in. That was at least before the pandemic, I believe. And the, it was just put off and put off. As you say, the funds finally ran out. So I want to know what you're going to do for Edgewater to build on what Diane's saying. I mean, no central air? Come on. This is 2023. Okay, you covered a lot of territory, and I think I can backtrack on here. First of all, I didn't say the funds ran out. It was funding that was available for a, a defined period of time. There's still the willingness and ability to do what's needed. And, and what I shared was the opportunities changed for us to do that. But those units you're talking about, St. Andrews Estates also has individually air-conditioned rooms. Um, not a shared unit, you know, so that you can change, everyone can adjust the temperature of your room to the temperature you'd like, and then the common areas are all on central air systems. So St. Andrews has the same type of system. Um, but the, the percentage, like the compounding of the increase is just a fact of life. I mean, I know, I, for, I shared it this morning, there were some questions about just the cost of living and the cost increases. And I know of team members that, that work in at the communities and, and live out in the local um, Broward and, and Palm Beach counties that cannot even get house homeowners insurance because carriers aren't carrying it. And some who can get it, but it's gone up 80%. So their insurance was 4000 now it's $7,500. Um, so the cost of living has just skyrocketed. And, and construction is one that's gone up over 25% over the last three years. I had some statistics I shared this morning just about lumber. Lumber, 16%. Concrete, 15% increase just in 2023. So the cost of construction is, continues to, to skyrocket. And there's inflation generalized, and there's inflation that's also segmented by industry. And we have to balance it all, and it does come at a cost. But our intention is to bring the best services to you in the best environment that we can and collaborate with you on the process. I know how transparent Susan George is in the process, and I know that she will continue to involve and engage residents. And, and, I've, and, I, and I know there's a frustration with seeing these an increase. You know, when you want 3%, I want 3%. Who doesn't want 3%? But the reality is when you look at inflation, then you have to look at ACTS and you say, well, what does ACTS do? Well, we're healthcare providers and have res resort type services with housekeeping and environmental service, I mean, environmental services and the culinary services and um, security and maintenance. We're competing with, especially in South Florida, with a very fertile environment. And then in an industry in healthcare where you see a decline in the number of nurses and you know, and new nursing schools trying to pick up the the make up the difference. But it's a it's a challenge. We are very transparent with, you know, we have a, you've received a letter, had a lot of information, three pages, you know, in the neighborhood of three pages, personalized to you and your financial conditions. Um, and then we back it with more layers, but we're very transparent through the process and even share retrospectively. Like when we come back in May, we're gonna talk about the 2023 budget, which by the way, operationally this year has, has, we've been sweating it out. It was a tough one. If I was up here, when I was up here last year talking about 2023, I told you it was a break even year. We did not actually put funding back into the reserves. We didn't bank on any of that. We couldn't take any money out of the reserves or shouldn't and didn't. So it was extremely conservative, but behind the scenes, the teams have been focused on changes in operations to make sure we hit those numbers, reduce the expenses and hit our sales numbers on time, as opposed to just a heavy wave. Well, you do get Medicare and we, it's in the budget. What you saw today is a broader view do we get it? I don't know what the exact number is for Edgewater Boca Point, but we have Medicare income. You know the number? Yeah, I'd have to look up the actual dollar amount, but I can tell you from a, a total, if we look at our total cash revenue, Medicare is a very, very small piece. It's less than 10% of our total revenue that we get. Because it, it is the it's changing where in the past, you know, when you had hips, knees replaced, you were discharged back to Willowbrook Court and you had to stay in Willowbrook Court. That's all changing, you're getting discharged home. Um, so we are, we are definitely seeing that, that business side of it change. 
but it is in the budget and it's it's helping to offset that monthly fee increase. But it does become Medicare year after year is also very much more conservative. They're not like the, the old hospital, three day hospital stay guaranteed 21 days in the nursing home is no more. You know, many people are going home. Now, I but, but we can get you, if you would like to see the local numbers, Susan can find those local numbers, but we do benefit from, the community benefits from Medicare dollars, and we are sensitive to the increases that you receive. There's no, I mean, there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure we reduce waste and, and not throw money out the door, um, but this, we're very conservative and, and transparent in the process to a fault sometimes because there are a lot of details that just don't make sense if you don't have a background in, in the process. Um, but Susan will get your local number so that she can share them. Yeah. Right. It's, last year it didn't go up at all. So this next year is going to go up 6.5%, but then it's reduced by 2.3% by, by the system. That's the government. They give you 6.5% increase and say, but we, we're going to take 2.3% back. That's not us. That's the system, the government system that we're participating in. We have a question yeah, in the back. You know, with, with climate change, I have a major concern. I face the back of the building and the parking lot, and when they put up the shutters for Willowbrook Court, I look and I see why am I not allowed, if I'm willing to pay for it, to put shutters on my windows. I have very old windows. One of them broke, they didn't replace it. What they did, they sealed it with silicone. So now I can't even do the yearly cleaning because they can't open the window. Somebody offered me shutters. I was told, no, I'm not allowed. I'm in the back, nobody sees it. When I came years ago, there were people who had hurricane shutters. I know they won't replace the windows, but at least I'd like to feel safe and be allowed to put shutters up on my windows. Okay, I don't know that we used to have shutters. We did. Right, but we do, we have a safe hurricane haven as well, you know, and right here in this area. So I hope you know that you would, you would be safe and there would be no expense if a window broke, you know, we would take care of the window, but, um, but, but the I shutters were also, shutters break. require uh, maintenance they require you know, the, the closing of the shutters. So there are limitations if we say yes to one person and then others put shutters on, then how are those managed? And that's rhetorical, you know, but, but I don't know. We can have more dialogue. You know, I was unaware of ever having shutters in the past. Though. Come on, Sally, give us a break. And OBT, right, in the common areas, yes. Right, right, I'm, I'm at common, yeah. And, Right in the clinical areas, right. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Correct. In Willowbrook, I mean, Oak Ridge Terrace. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, this is Chris. Uh, I want to talk about the latest law around here as far as like when you get the de destruction, you get some, you know, everything's out of order, and you call somebody in like an inspector, and he wants to give them, he gives all his details to the insurance company. Florida has eliminated the middleman. You don't have to use him. You might save money in that way. They'll take the contractor's decision and they'll talk back and forth with the contractor. And as far as shutters go, because I was on the board of Kings Point, it's a fire rule. Their fire department doesn't want those shutters. So I don't know about here, but we had to take them all down. Okay, appreciate the feedback and the information. Thank you. Sally's right about the shutters. Herb and Gladys Jacobson lived in my, in C building, and Herb moved out after Gladys passed away. But they had hurricane, sh hurricane shutters already when I moved here 11 years ago. And they're still up, even though there are new residents there. Okay. And I, don't, I haven't seen them closed for a few years, but they were closed at one time when we had we were given warning about a hurricane. All right, thank you. You, you can't blame things on Herb when he's here, only when he's not here. <laughs> but Herb's still here, he's yep. in a <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what the history was, but the reality is on a five-story building, you know, if, if shutters had to be open and closed, 
um, that would that would be another challenge. We guarantee your safety, and we guarantee, and you should have homeowners insurance for the interior content. And as time goes on, we are replacing the windows, you know, in an efficient way that's affordable for all of us. Um, but it is a process. I know it's frustrating for some, but we're not going to change the process. It would, we can continue the dialogue about it, but that that is the process. Uh, you said we are eventually uh, replacing the windows. As we do new construction, oh, no, not windows new are construction. being replaced. What about the ones that have been here for a few years? I have jealousies, and we're not exactly happy with them. But uh, what, I, what bothers us when someone leaves, we get new win they get new windows. The ones that have been here for a while, we don't get any new windows. Yeah. And I thought maybe you'd replace them slowly. Uh, we are replacing them, but the entry fees of the new accommodations are covering the cost of the windows and the enclosures. Mm -hmm. There's no affordable way. You cannot afford for us to go in and replace all the windows without having fees applied to it, basically. Mm -hmm. So yes, the entry fees are, are covering, and that's the process that we're using. Because we have jealousies, and I see new windows going up in place of the jealousies, and I said, why not us? After 11 years, I figured we'd get something more. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you, you got the accommodation that you paid for within the entrance fee. You know, we have the benefit of having Sue here. I love the debate about the windows, but we have Sue here. Are there financial questions that Sue, it's a, such a benefit to have the CFO with us. Usually in the presentations, they would tell us what the reserves are. Uh, how many days do we have? Like you would, they would tell us how many days we could go without uh, uh, without paying the bills and stuff like that. So for the 2024 budget, we're estimating 260 days but that excludes our unrealized losses. So we've been hit just like everybody else um, with our investments, but those losses are unrealized. Um, they're below the line, they don't impact us. We hold on to those investments because if we can't and we sell them, then we do realize a loss and then that makes our operating statement look very ugly. So we, we do our hardest to, to hold on to them. But yeah, we're estimating 260 days for next year. To add to what? I think that's off. Is that microphone? Is it, is it, okay, is it on now? Okay, to add to the conversation about the windows, several years ago, I asked if I could just have the new windows put in my bedroom, which they agreed to. And I said, okay, What's the cost and will you share it with me? And they said, no, you want the windows. You have to pay for them. And I never got the windows because my answer to them was, I pay for the windows fully and you still have them after I die and it didn't cost you a cent. And that's what I feel about putting in the new windows. We put in the new windows, X will always have them and I won't always be here for it. Thank you. And Ax it would be nice to be able to say, of course, we'll put in all the windows, but you know, there are limited resources that we budget to cover a lot of areas, and it's just not financially feasible to do so. That still costs, it still costs, and it's just not gonna work. So I'm sorry that, that you don't like the response, but we're, our track that we're on is, is the one we're going to remain on for replacement of the windows. Yes, sir. I have a question regarding the preparation of the budget. And how involved was Edgewater in preparing its own budget? And how is it then revised or modified by uh, headquarters? And then why would we pay a uniform increase rather than by individual uh, facility? That's a great question. And I'm going to start with the answer, and then Sue can finish. But you, you, at the beginning of the presentation, there was a slide that showed the obligated group and the two management companies. That's what this budget was prepared for. The obligated group of communities, which are 22, 22 of the ACTS communities are in the obligated group. 
those communities operate as one business entity, have one employer identification number. So essentially, they're one operation. Each community has its own set of challenges and, and needs. And then there's a, there are financial process for reinvestment, which I think is really what's, what residents would like to know, like how much, you know, how do you do the capital investments back to the communities. But, but they're done initially just as a, a full obligated group. Each community has a meeting with a finance team to review line by line the, his, the history, um, the current expenses year to date, and then to make the budget assumption for the next year. So we, have a, we can have a look back and we can look at each, they go line by line looking at the budget and what the needs will be for the coming year. Um, it does go through a cycle where we look at it and say, well, that's we need, in order to hit the targets, and the, a big part of the target is your increase, potential increase, we go back to the communities and say, you're going to need to find some savings within your budget. So that second round, it comes back, and I actually receive it for the region. So I get the regional number, and then I go back to my communities and say, team, we need to find these dollars to refine the budget so we can hit those targets. So as opposed to the executive director just saying, here's what we need, and then it's just given, and then you operate. There's a, there are, it's nice because a finance team sees 22 examples, and they, they, they can tell when there's some extra opportunities for refinements in the budget, and also when there are opportunities for additional. They say, you know, you missed this, you missed that, or have you considered this? Um, so an, an example of that is a second person you know, you saw the second person fee increase. Well, there's a second person that's a revenue source too. And oftentimes communities miss that calculation. So the finance team will say, take a look at your second person fees to see if you've hit the number because you might have some revenue that you didn't realize there. I don't know, Sue, if you want to expand on that from the financial perspective. I covered it? Okay. I hope that answers your question. A follow-up? And this concerns a recent change in the law here in Florida, uh, Section 651, with the dedicated resident representative. And as you probably are aware, that this person is appointed by the resident board and should participate in discussions with uh, the, uh, the entity as it prepares its budget. Uh, have, I, it's something that's just been er, introduced, and I don't know how active or how involved uh, Edgewater, uh, St. Andrews, and other uh, facilities here or communities here have been involved. That's another good question. And actually, that portion of 651 isn't new. There were some refinements within that part of the regulation about participation, but ACTS has been doing that with their resident leadership for decades. Um, and the, your appointed person, the standard person, which we send a letter to um, using the correct language from 651, is the president of your association is that person. Our letter, when it goes to the president for, for engagement in the early portion of the budget, um, actually um, Karen Christian talk, Christensen talked about starting in the spring and going through the fall. Well, one of the very first meetings is with the resident representatives, and we usually have a larger group. I think we have two from each community. And the president typically brings someone with financial background or financial experience that's on the resident board. Um, and they participate in the meeting where the, the forecasts are looked at and the assumptions. And here are the challenges we're foreseeing. And here's what we're doing as we go into the budget cycle. And then at the end of the process, the resident president will get another invitation um, with, within that letter. It says, or designee, so they can send a designee in their place. Might be someone with financial background. And they actually attend the ACTS board meeting. Um, and the board, when the, there's a finance committee that reviews the budget and the budget process, the chair of that committee is actually Marvin Mashner, um, past CEO of ACTS. So he has a lot of knowledge, and he's a CPA with a hospital CPA background. So he chairs the finance committee that reviews the budget and then presents the budget to the board. The president or their designee from each community also attends that meeting. They hear the, pres the same presentation that's made to the ACTS board. Um, comments are open then. We can, they can ask questions in advance. They receive a packet in advance, but they can ask questions. Resident participants can, and then the board votes on the budget. This all happened at the very uh, end of October, just right before your letters came out. So that we do, Chapter 651 made some changes. I honestly don't remember specifics. I do know that whatever changes were made were not impactful to us because we were already including residents and have 
for, for decades, actually. But good question. That same question was posed at Azalea Trace in another meeting I had recently, and I was actually, I did the background, I read 651 to see what the changes were. I just, I don't remember. It was, a, it was just a few language changes within it, but it did, I think, through FLICRA, Florida Life Care Residents Association. It was a line item discussion, and there are a lot of organizations that are not transparent, that are very reluctant to share what's going on under the hood, and ACTS is not one of those. We've always had residents um, actually on our board and include residents in the discussion process. Excuse me, it's Sally Davis again. I think I'm confused now by the window uh, discussion. Are you saying that you will move the entire three floors, rehab, and everybody in case there's a hurricane, or will you close the shutters, or both? I don't, I, that's where I'm confused. Right, we really didn't get into that detail, but we would close the shutters um, for a hurricane, probably up to category three. There may be conditions for the whole community in which we take other measures, if there were really a major hurricane, through just an abundance of caution, we might um, think otherwise and bring residents together. We didn't really go over that, but no, you're safe at home. We, and we would close them up to category three. We would start really just looking, you know, which direction is a hurricane coming from, which parts of the building are impacted. Oh, correct, correct, correct. But you're fine. Okay. Well, thank you for your participation. Sue and I are up here if you have any additional questions, and, and Susan George as well. But thank you for participating.